Hello students. So today we are still in chapter three, looking at markets, supply and demand. We talked about some market basics and then we talked about the demand curve. Now we're exploring what factors can shift demand. We saw in the previous episode that income and related goods shift demand. Now we'll see how consumer tastes can shift demand. So one good to see a large change in consumer tastes is marijuana. It used to be considered dangerous, but now it is seen as largely harmless. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that is the perception. And some places are even selling marijuana as a health food. So a large change has taken place with consumer tastes. Now, as long as you'll believe that to be true, whether or not it's actually accurate, it's going to shift the demand curve. So now there's going to be more demand for marijuana than it used to be in the past because consumer tastes are different now. A couple of years ago, fidget spinners were very, very popular. Nowadays, they seem to have fallen from fashion. As a result, demand for them is now going to be lower than it was previously. So you can see demand starts out over here when they were trendy, and now it's back over here when they have fallen from favor. Now, price expectations can also shift demand. So, for example, if you think a company's stock price is going to go up, you want to buy it now while it's still cheap. So you buy a stock when it has a price of $10, you hope to resell in the future when its price is $15, there is a $5 profit. So the stock market is often influenced by price expectations. So demand is going to go up if people think that the price will rise. And likewise, if you think the price is going to fall, then you want to sell your stock now while it still has a high value rather than wait for that drop to happen and sell it at a loss. So that also can shift demand. The number of buyers in a market can also shift demand. So here is one example. So I used to work at Truman State University. It's in a very rural part of Missouri, a small town called Kirksville. Population there is about 17,000. Roughly 5,000 or so of that is college students. Their local economy depends quite heavily on the university. So a few years ago, enrollment at Truman State was falling, and that's when I started to worry if I would get laid off. That caused me a job hunt, and I got this job at Binghamton to escape. So when enrollment at Truman State Falls, that has a big impact on the apartment market in Kirksville. So now there's a lot less demand for apartments there that causes demand to shift back because you just have fewer students trying to find an apartment there. So demand starts out over here when you have enrollment being higher. Once enrollment falls, you have fewer tenants, so demand goes back over there. So I said that we'll talk about taxes more in Chapter 5. That's going to give us much more discussion of government policy in general. So for now, just add to your list of things that can shift demand. We'll talk about that in more depth later. So that wraps up the demand side. So next up, we will talk about supply. So supply tells you how much the firm would produce at each price. So again, your book's terminology is a bit idiosyncratic. They call the table the supply schedule, and this over here is a supply curve. Most books and texts will refer to supply 
to mean either one. Both these things are showing you the same information. So the price is four. The firm is producing 20 units. We show it in the graph over here. When a price goes down to three, they only sell 15. Sorry, so they only produce 15. So that's over there, 315. When price is two, they produce 10. That corresponds to this point in the graph. Price of one, produce five, that's over here. And when the price is zero, they don't have any incentive to produce anything at all. So Dirk, one of the um, textbook authors, let's say he has a factory and he makes widgets. So here's why a supply curve has this particular shape. He could always make more widgets if he wants to, but it's going to get more and more expensive if he keeps trying to scale up production. To produce more widgets, he has to either get a bigger factory, which is going to cost him a lot of money up front. Alternatively, he can pay his workers overtime, which will be extra expensive in order to get them to produce more. So yeah, he can make more widgets if he wants to. It's always a possibility, but making more widgets keeps getting progressively more and more and more expensive. So to make that extra production worthwhile, the price would have to go up for Dirk to want to expand. That's why he's only willing to produce a small amount when price is low. If price is only $1, then paying workers overtime or buying a bigger factory is not worthwhile. If price is all the way up to $4, then he could make a profit even though he's paying overtime and buying bigger factories. Price is so high that all that expense is justified. So in general, Dirk will produce more when the price is higher. And that's true not just for Dirk and not just true for his widget factory. That's actually true in general. This is called the law of supply and this is a very, 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 very big deal in this class and in economics in general. So all it's equal. When price goes up, quantity supplied should increase. Similarly, if price goes down, quantity supplied should decrease, all else equal. So in our notation, we use P for price. So if P goes up, QS is quantity supplied, that should also go up. So Dirk's widget factory followed that because in order to justify the expense of paying overtime or buy a new factory, the price had to go up in order to make that worth it. Even though this might have been the first time you heard about the law of supply, your behavior may have already followed it in the past. Maybe you used to work a part-time job, and if your wage had been higher, you would have been willing to work more hours. On the other hand, if your employer tries to cut your wage, you might decide, I'm just going to quit. Not worth it anymore. So recall I was saying in an earlier episode that in most markets, we are on the demand side. The labor market is the exception. That's because in the labor market, we're the ones who are providing, we're the ones who are supplying labor to firms. So law of supply does apply to you when you're in the labor market. So again, law of supply is a very, very big deal. And you'll want to put that in your long-term memory for sure. All right, so here are some graphs. For each one of them, think about whether it follows the law of supply or if it violates the law of supply. Go ahead and pause the video here and think about that. All right, let's go over the answer. So in our first graph, when price goes up, quantity also goes up. So that follows the law of supply. So graph A is looking good. For graph B, when price goes up, quantity is going down. 
That's the opposite of what the law of supply says. So that can't be right. Law, graph C, when price goes up, quantity goes down. That can't be right. So to be clear, the problem with graph C is not that it's nonlinear. Nonlinearity is okay. We established that earlier. The problem with graph C is that whenever price goes up, quantity goes down. That's inconsistent with the law of supply. So in graph D, for this part, price goes up and quantity go up, so that's okay. But over here, when price goes up, quantity goes down. That can't be right. So to follow the law of supply, it's got to follow the law of supply for the entire graph, not just part of it. So overall, we say graph D violates the law of supply. There's no in-between case. Either follows the law of supply entirely, or it's in violation. So you can also form the market supply. So I'm using Dirk and Lee because they are the textbook authors' names. When the price is zero, they both produce nothing because there's no incentive to do anything. So the market supply is zero. If the price is one and Dirk produces five and Lee produces three, overall market supply is going to be five plus three, which is eight. When price is two, Dirk makes 10 and Lee makes six. So market supply is going to be 16. For price is three, 15 and 9 is 24. Lastly, when price is 4, Dirk makes 20 and Lee makes 12, so the market supplies 32. And you can also add them together graphically like this. So here, if you look at the distance between 0 and 5 and the price is 1, and add it to this distance, you get 8, which is the market supply. And likewise for the other points. Price is 4, Dirk makes 20. If you add it to Lee's 12, you get the market supply of 32, and so on. Now, market supply can also be kinked just like individual, just like on market demand. So it follows the exact same procedure as before, so I won't give a separate example of that. So that's the supply curve, and that wraps up this episode. Be sure to tune in for our next episode, in which we'll talk about shifts in supply.